And here is some info about the jet stream. The jet streams usually flow in a wavy pattern, and you can see the wavy pattern goes up and down and up and down and so on from west to east. And on Earth, there are four of them. You can see two up here in the northern hemisphere, one closer to the poles, one close to the equator. And it's going to be the same thing in the southern hemisphere as well. So there's going to be a total of four jet streams. Strong storms often form as the jet stream loops. Now, I pulled this off of AccuWeather.com, and you can see you have the jet stream, which is coming down. And it has stormy right here where it loops. Now, that's not always the case, but it does seem to be a pattern that you probably need to know with the jet stream. It kind of serves a similar function to the currents and to the easterlies and westerlies. It kind of brings cold air down from the northern regions and warm air up from the uh, southern regions, northern hemisphere. So it kind of spreads some of the heat out, some of the heat out throughout the earth. Now, one thing that does happen is that it affects jet travel. Let's say you're here in Atlanta and you are taking a jet to California. If you end up going this way, once you get about, about here, you're going to be in the jet stream and you're actually going to be fighting that 125 or 124 mile an hour wind as you're going toward Los Angeles which would make it longer, but if you were coming from Los Angeles to here, it probably would be smart to get in the jet stream and then kind of ride the jet stream all the way and then cut down to Atlanta. It kind of has a big factor there. So uh, you can see another copy of the jet stream right here, the polar jet stream and the tropical jet stream. Let's go to another slide in class about the beach about how you have a breeze at the beach during the daytime and I'm going to talk about the breeze, the change in the breeze during the nighttime. Let's see, let's continue what we had once before. We once had how you had unequal heating made unequal heating made the breeze. Now you often have a breeze at the beach not necessarily because of unequal amount of sunlight but you have it because of the way the water accepts heat and the way the land accepts heat. Land heats faster than water. So as a result, when the sun is out, you're going to have higher amounts of rising hot air. And when you have higher amounts of rising hot air, you're going to have lower pressure. So out here in the ocean, the water doesn't accept the the uh, heat as well as the land does, so you're gonna, not going to have as much rising hot air and you're going to have a little bit of higher pressure. So which direction does the wind flow? It flows from high pressure to low pressure. So what you're going to have is wind during the daytime coming from the breeze will be coming from the ocean on to the land. Now that's exactly opposite at nighttime. Since land heats faster than water, it also cools faster than water. So it serves as the exact opposite effect. So whenever it is nighttime, whenever it is nighttime, you have more heat out here because you have quicker cooling over here. Quicker cooling, so that means that you will actually have lower pressure here because you are going to have some element of heat rising and you'll have higher pressure here because you won't have as much heat rising. That means in the nighttime you will have the breeze going back out to the sea. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. The mountains are the same way. Now typically on the mountains you have at the top of the mountains will be lower pressure and at the bottom of the mountains you have higher pressure. But it also is affected by the amount of sun and the time of day. Mountains act the same way in that in the daytime, look what's getting the most sun here. It's going to be the tops of these mountains are getting the most sun. So what happens when it gets the most sun? You have warmer here, more warm air rising. So that will continue to have low, 
and you have less sun here, which means you have less air rising, so you'll continue to have high. So in the daytime, you have what you would have expected. You expect the breeze going up the mountain, but that is not going to be the case at nighttime. The slope here cools quicker. The slope here is going to cool quicker. So that means you're going to have more hot air coming here, and which means you have more hot air going up, which leaves a low pressure. So remember, it's nighttime here. So you will actually have higher pressure here because you have more cooling at the top of the mountain. So where it's just the opposite as it was in the daytime. In the nighttime, the wind goes back down the mountain, whereas in the daytime, it had gone back up the mountain. Now that also ends up being a, something that affects India. India is not the only place where the monsoon season, but it's the one that's uh, easy to talk about because of the diagram like this. Here's what we have in the winter. In the winter, you have the land is cooler than the water. So you get more heat down through here, which means you get more air going up and you have lower pressure over the water. Now this is during the winter when you have the lower pressure. And that means on the land you have the higher pressure. You have the higher pressure and the wind will end up blowing, just like it says here, off to the sea. Which means when you have rain, it's probably going to be rain. You might have a lot of rain right here at Sri Lanka. But you're probably not going to have much on land, but that's exactly opposite during the summer, which is going to be the monsoon season. During the summer, you have the land will warm up. Land is going to be warmer than the water around it. So you've got the sun beating down on the land. You're going to have more air coming up hot air coming up and that means you'll have the low pressure. In fact, you see the low pressure right here, which means out on the waves on the sea, it will be a higher pressure. So high to low, you get all these arrows coming in and what's going to happen is it's going to bring all that moisture. And you have several months of the year where you have a big time rainy season. It's called the monsoon season in places like India where it will rain almost every day. Now we have some uh, a, a little humidity alert thing down here, which we will come back to. But let's look at this page here. We need to define some terms. Humidity is the amount of water vapor, the amount of water vapor that's in the air. You I mean you know this? Even around you right now, there is water that's in the air. Set it down next to the computer. After a while, you'd have condensation from that water that's in the air. So in, in times when you have a high humidity, like in the summer, you have a lot of water vapor in the air. You're not going to have as much typically in the winter, but you do tend to have more in the summer. But this is something that does kind of vary from place to place and time to time. It's kind of a, a, a different cycle. If you have evaporation, evaporation from the water is going to make humidity. I mean, it, it puts water vapor in the air. But then up here, when you get to the clouds, and see how kind of awful cloud I can draw. Uh, isn't that pretty? But anyway, when that vapor comes up and, and makes the clouds, then that actually takes away from the humidity. So on this little scene here, you have a lot of humidity in between and humidity gets just as absolute, the air gets as absolute full as you can get of water and that means that it is saturated. <laughs> air hold, can hold no more water. It can hold no more water. And that's when the rate of evaporation and condensation is equal. So the amount of air you have, air, water vapor you have coming up from the ocean would be the same amount of water vapor that would form in, say, these clouds. You would have a saturated amount of humidity in the air. Let me talk about relative humidity. It's, it's the same thing, except relative humidity is putting a percentage to the humidity. And we're going to go back to, the, to this right now. Or I thought we were. 
Yeah, here we are. We have the relative humidity right here. It's going to be a percentage. Now, this percentage is going to be the vapor that's in the air over the vapor that the air can hold. So if you have it at 70%, then you can actually have more vapor in the air. It's a little bit muggy at 70%, but you still can have more vapor in the air. Now, <laughs> we're going to go down to the dew point here, and you can see dew point over on the next page. Dew point is the temperature at which the air does become saturated. And it's going to become saturated where you have clouds. So the dew point, you're not going to reach until you get to the clouds. Now, when you have fog, that means the dew point and the temperature meet. So let's see if that's the case back here. And it is not. You can see here that the temperature is nearly 73 degrees, but the dew point is about 63 degrees. So when you have the land here, uh, you may even have a pond here where there's some water, and when you have the evaporation up, whenever that evaporation hits the 63 degree mark, or in this case 62.9 degrees, because you know it goes, temperature gets colder as you go up, whenever it hits that mark, that's where it's going to form the clouds. At that point is where it forms the clouds. Have you ever been uh, riding up a hill and you have run into when the clouds start? And that is, that is a, a perfect example of whenever your vehicle has actually driven up far enough to hit the dew point. So the dew point is the point at which you have the condensation, the point at which the air does become saturated.